Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President, for the opportunity to join in this debate on the budget debate for fiscal 2022-2023. Madam President, I have to say if nothing really good comes out of the debate, at least by Senator Baca speaking so early and during the daytime hours when the population is tuned in, they will actually see what Senator Bacchus and his ministry, what he looks like and learn a little bit about it because I think that the Ministry of Digital Transformation to date is something like an urban legend and a myth that has existed since it was created and no one, particularly the parents of the thousands of children who lost their educational opportunities during the pandemic can actually say that they know anything about digital transformation being done by this government. Madam President, equal access, equitable access to education was a goal that was actively pursued by the People's Partnership government, and this government destroyed it. So sitting here today and coming immediately before me to listen to a whole presentation on what a ministry intends to do of digital transformation, I have to say it reminded me of how out of touch this government is with the real critical needs of the people. And that, if anything, is the theme. It is the theme that has underlied this entire budget debate. But as we speak about destruction and education, Madam President, you know, we are in the um, season of Diwali, this time that leading up to Diwali, and I, I attended a Ram Lila celebration on Sunday night, and I witnessed, you know, the, the burning of the, um, the effigy of Rawan, the symbol of evil and wickedness, and someone who, in the story of the Ramayana, he allowed his ego to get the better of him, to inflict hurt and suffering upon people. It's amazing that on Monday, what transpired in a virtual courtroom in this country reminded me so much of that story that I witnessed in a play form, uh, in dramatic form on Sunday night. And today, Madam President, I feel like we are in the city of Ayodhya, where we witness the victory of not one, but two rams that have become victorious over the schemes, the maneuverings meant to score political mileage, and it has a cost attached to it, which the taxpayer must continue to bear because this government, through its budget, through its expenditure, continues to use the Treasury to further its own motives, its own objectives to improve their lives and secure themselves in office, but not treating with the needs of this population. And I will demonstrate throughout my contribution how ineptitude, bad mind, nepotism, are the key factors which have influenced so much of our public expenditure that I think it deserves, this budget deserves the outcry that it is receiving from the public because when you see the wastage of public funds by this government, you have to wonder how it is they can stand with a straight face and tell people to make sacrifices. Madam President, the sad thing about it is that when the Ram Deans, the Ram Barans, and the Ram Logans of this country overcome what is meant to destroy them based on nothing but political bad mind and malice, the taxpayer must continue to foot the bill. When the budget was first read on the 26th of September and a series of fiscal measures were laid out, increasing the burdens on an already burdened population, what stood out to many people is that there was not a single meaningful policy measure to address the scourge of crime and several other social issues making life unbearable for the working class in this country. The government's failure, inability or unwillingness to deliver on projects and to implement meaningful policies means that the return to the taxpayer is simply nothing. The Treasury is being emptied via the payment of legal fees, the payment of damages and costs to citizens who are successful against the state because the state has embarked upon a series of 
positions and actions that are detrimental to our institutions in this country. They ride roughshod over the rights of citizens and they are wrong and strong. And again, every single loss is not a loss felt by the individual pockets of the decision makers in those cases, Madam President. It is the person who has to cringe when they stand at the fuel pump now at the gas station. I, and in the middle of all of that, people who paid a salary in Parliament have their private practice, and on top of that, which is now public knowledge, collect something like $1.8 million in legal fees in the last three years, will stand and tell us, well, if you cannot afford certain things, go back to riding bicycle and cooking with coal pot. That is the advice coming from a government which squanders our money on what I could only call vanity and malice. Madam President, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, a critical, constitutionally secured, independent office, is being trampled on, starved of much needed resources. It is part of an overall trend of institutional degradation that we see taking place since this government came into office. So bad it is, Madam President, that in today's Express editorial, they were compelled in their opinion relative to the government's overreach in the Ram Logan and Ram Dean matter to say, this indemnity, and I quote from today's editorial in the Express, this indemnity will stand for all time as evidence of a government's flagrant abuse of power and willingness to subvert key institutions of accountability and justice. To command their state resources in a dodged and questionable pursuit of political rivals. Only a desperate government could have offered the guarantees given by Al Rawi to Nelson. Madam President, I could not have put it better than that myself. What is said today by the Express must reverberate throughout this country so that every time you stand by that fuel pump and you understand why you are deprived of the fuel subsidy you enjoyed for years. Every time your child cannot go to school because the place flood out and the regional corporation have no releases to clean the drains in your area. Every time the new rule used to be we drive on the left side of the road, now we drive on whatever is left of the road. You must remember, you must remember that millions and millions and millions of your taxpayers' dollars have been spent by this government to pursue their political rivals in the most underhanded manner that we have ever seen in this country. I say so. I say that it is the most underhanded, Madam President, but I feel that I must take the opportunity to remind the population today that this is not the first time. And earlier this year, with the collapse in the Privy Council, having to quash the PR Core 1 inquiry that took, I think, something like 20 years of judicial time. 20 years of judicial time, resources, and legal fees in pursuit of another um, set of parties linked to the opposition by a PNM government. The whole thing fell apart based on the interference of an attorney general. And it was well documented, Madam President, since uh, what it was, maybe 2006 or 7 around there. And I have to quote. I must quote from the Mustill report because I am demonstrating to the population how this government spends their money to weaponize a legal system in order to target their political opponents. In the Mustill report, which was for, uh, around 2007 and which again was featured and reported again when this matter came up in the Privy Council earlier this year, the Mustill report says the government continues, sorry, the find it. Yes. It said, when we called for the investigation um, in an article entitled The Many Roles of the Attorney General, they quoted from that report in the Express, Madam President, the date of the article, I'll get it for you now. I'm trying to be tech savvy like my friend Senator Bacchus. July 11, 2022, just a little bit earlier this year, quoted again from the Mustel Tribunal when they examined that whole incident involving the interference of a PNM Attorney General in the Piaco One inquiry and his influence. 
And what they said, the picture presented to this tribunal almost defies belief. We have heard allegations against the Attorney General who could have given oral evidence to rebut them but did not. They went on to say, and I quote, it is plain that the imputations are that they got together and influenced what was being done. What has been said is that there has been a small group of conspirators designed to pervert the course of justice, and the Attorney General is at very least, at very least, was a part of the scheme. Madam President, history repeating itself and thousands upon thousands and millions upon millions of dollars going down the drain again now. That was then and this is now, but it has not changed. The modus operandi of the PNM remains the same. The government will use the pandemic as a crutch to disguise its incompetence and failure to improve the lives of citizens. They have done so for the last three budgets that we have stood here and listened to. And they do not deliver to citizens on their promises. I will focus specifically on how broken promises and what has become known as the implementation deficit of the PNM government continues to create a society that is like a ticking time bomb because citizens are so frustrated. Nowhere is that more evident than in the government's failure to tackle crime and improve the delivery of justice in this country. The crime and justice system, Madam President, will be the focus of my contribution and the allocations and provisions and provisions for expenditure in this budget. When we say it is a justice system, the reason you say that is because the essence of a system is that it consists of many parts that have to work together and complement each other to produce the desired results. It is exactly that. It is a system. So when you make a tweak here and a tweak there and you do not have an across the board aligned objectives pursuing you know, a common goal, and the individual goals of each agency are not pursued in a manner that's consistent with the overall objective. You have chaos, and that is what we have right now. We have chaos in our justice system, particularly on the criminal side. Let me use the example of staffing. We have heard over and over about the backlog of matters in the judiciary. So they created more posts in the judiciary. You have the creation of the post of magistracy registrars, and you have masters being put into the criminal division of the high court. And that sounds nice, right? They boast and they pat themselves on the back. We get in plant and machinery, people and what was the next thing? Process. I don't know where all the plant and machinery and people and process was when indemnity agreements were being drafted in the back room, if the plant and machinery and people and process didn't get involved then. But when they boast about these things, Madam President, what they do not tell the population is that a significant number of people who have filled these new posts came out of the DPP's office. Likewise, when they created the Public Defender's Office and expanded the staff complement of persons who will deal with criminal matters through the Legal Aid and Advisory Authority, there was a large exodus of staff from the office of the DPP. So as anybody would know, in any given courtroom, at a minimum, you have at least three people that you need. The judicial officer, the prosecutor, and the defender. And if all three moving parts of the criminal justice system are not being staffed and one is draining the other, and you are improving on two but not the other, then the system goes nowhere. And that's where we've been going with this government, nowhere. We come here year after year after year. Every time we have a bill in this house talking about crime, we talk about it, but we go in nowhere. Madam President, some of the most experienced staff have left the DPP's office for greener pastures, and I commend them, I compliment them, I do not, I find no fault with them. They are doing what is right. But if you do not build up the office of the DPP at the same time that you are building the others, what do you expect to happen? You cannot sit here and boast of accomplishments when the system as a whole is simply stuck. This is not rocket science, it is common sense. But I think if there's one thing I have learned to this administration is that there's an uncommonness of common sense, and it has been nothing short of astounding, particularly when it comes to the office of the Attorney General and the management of the legal affairs of this country. And in fairness, I would like to say this, this is a situation that was created and you know, proceed, came long before this particular Attorney General was sitting in the seat. But now the problem has to be addressed. And has it been addressed in this budget? 
we must look at what they are doing. If you look at the allocations, there is no increase in wages and salaries under the allocation of personnel for the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, and there is a $500,000 decrease in the allocation for contract employment. So what is the plan? What is the plan? I, I found an allocation for fees to be paid to external counsel. And there was an allocation for $20 million, and they used $19.1 million out of it. So is that the plan, that we will starve the DPP's office of permanent staff and permanent resources so that we could continue to brief our external um, attorneys and enrich them? The, the allocation coming up from this year for fees is $15 million. A savings is about a $400 uh, $4 million savings. I don't know if now that they don't have to retain Mr. Jenkins to persecute Mr. Ramdin and Mr. Ram Logan if they've saved some money there. But the understaffing of the DPP's office is nothing new. When we had the Achille Charles decision and the Court of Appeal of this country refused to grant the state a stay of that judgment so that they, could, they must deal with the applications, the Director of Public Prosecutions filed an affidavit and it was re widely reported in the media on uh, April 7, 2022. The DPP's office said that they were overburdened by 78 bail applications. Bail applications, you know, not 78 trials that they had to do, not 78 um, people who had been waiting on, 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 on a trial for years and years in Romania. The people just make a bail application. And his office was inundated so much so that they went before the court to ask for a stay. And of course, the court refused them because the court is mindful. The court is mindful that what they must do is in the best interest of the people of this country. In, the, in an article um, written by Professor Ramesh Dirsaran about the situation that emerged at that point in time, he made mention of that um, situation that was occurring there. And he talked about the fact that the DPP's office only had, I think, 46 46 of 137 approved positions. And do you know when those 137 positions were approved? Under the People's Partnership Government. Because under the People's Partnership Government, recognizing that we needed to get talented and skilled and professional staffing into that office in order to move the criminal justice system forward, there was an entire plan consisting of specialized division, sexual offense crimes and gender-based violence, fraud, fraud division, to be staffed with, you know, specialized um, and things so that you are not paying millions and millions and millions to the forensic auditors on the outside and so on. You build your capacity in-house. That was the plan and the vision of a government that had a vision. But this government vision is to just write checks for the friend, family, and finances. They just want to spend the money on the fees, external fees. And of course, who could forget? Who could forget that it is this government that came to this parliament and made sure that they remove legal fees and accounting services from the purview of the procurement regulator? Because they have to make sure they have to make sure that whatever allocation is made in this budget for any ministry, department, statutory body, or otherwise for legal fees, it is at their own will and discretion. And they hid for years and years and years behind privacy and all sorts of other ridiculous arguments to not disclose those fees until we took them to court under the Freedom of Information Act and they were forced to disclose it. And the same people who stood in this parliament and lamented for years about the UNC spent a billion dollars in legal fees, have spent over a billion dollars now across the board in ministries and statutory authorities. And what do they have to show for it? In one matter alone, the Attorney General under the People's Partnership Government, which is the OPV arbitration, brought home a check for $1.4 billion. I can anticipate the Attorney General getting up and boasting that they win um, what the, the case that confirms Surat is good law. As they claim to fame, as they claim to fame Surat, but they have actually done nothing. They have not won a single critical matter 
against anyone who has sued the state and they have spent over a billion dollars. Now, when we had that plan for the DPP's office, Madam President, the reason why we were doing that and building the capacity is because we understand you have to keep the talent in-house. Being prosecutors is a very um, specialized field and some people have want to specialize and develop themselves in various areas. The $19 million that are spent last year on fees from the office of the DPP is the equivalent of salaries for, you know how many states, senior state council, and a senior state council is very senior, you are like four or five tiers up, you, you work there for almost eight to 10 years before you reach the state of senior state council. You could have retained 600 senior state council for a year for that $19 million. We don't even have enough criminal in this country to prosecute with 600 senior state councils. If you add to that the $35 million that the TTP is paying for um, people involved in what they call specialist prosecutions, I call it something not close to prosecution, but not quite prosecution, it sounds like prosecution, but the people from the United Kingdom who are tasked with targeting high level, as they say, high level political targets. $35 million when they ask to be retained, SRP, Kate, and others, to target the political opponents of the PNM. If they say, if the PNM say jump, they ask how high, if they say wind to the side, they say left or right, and that is what they want. They do not want a strong DPP office, a strong DPP or a strong DPP's office. And we could see why now, look at what happened to them on Monday. And that is why they will continue to starve them of resources. Now, again, if you want to train people and staff the office, you have to have a place to put them. And there must be somewhere, because you know, we are not a disciplined people who could work from home apparently, so we have to have office space. I want to address the issue of new office space for the officers of the DPP in both North and South. Madam President, on the 30th of July, about 10, 11 days before the general election in 2020, I ain't talking about July this year, I ain't talking about July last year, I'm talking about July the year before. Keys were handed over in a nice ceremony to the brand new spanking offices of the, uh, for the DPP's office in North. NIDCO handed over the keys to the then Attorney General, smiling and gushing, saying that it came in $2 million under budget. $2 million under budget and that it was ready now. And I quote from what he said, we have quadrupled the office space. We can now take the entire shortfall of the DPP's office and fill it because they have quadrupled the office space of the DPP's office. Madam President, those offices remain vacant today. As we speak, that office building is vacant. And in that same interview when the offices were handed over, the Attorney General said the South office is to be ready in September. Not September as in last month, not even September last year. We're talking about September 2020. Again, those offices are vacant. They have nobody in them. The two places, the two offices to hold staff for the DPP are both there, vacant and they are still there, overwhelmed, getting buff when they go to the Court of Appeal, as many people would have seen in the, uh, in the, in the um, papers recently, and they cannot even handle 78 bail applications at a time. But, Madam President, when we look at the expenditure for the outfitting of the offices, the DPP's office in North in 2021, $4 million was the actual revised estimate. 2022, nothing was estimated, but they spent $2.7 million. And in 2023, there's an estimate for another $1 million. This is the, outf the office that they post about and collect keys for in 2020 and four plus uh, 6.7 and 7.7 .7 million dollars later, when they boast about saving two million dollars, the DPP cannot occupy the office. In San Fernando, $1.3 million estimated in 2022, but they actually spent $2.3 million. And in 2023, another $5 million estimated to get those offices ready. So clearly they ain't going anywhere this year because there's still $5 million worth of work to be done in that office promised to them in September of 2020. Where are we going with the criminal justice system when an integral part of it cannot move? 
And why is that the case? Is it deliberate? I must ask the question. Is it deliberate because other people are being better paid and are willing to give the advice and the opinions that they want? When we move on to other areas that affect the delivery of justice to people, let us talk about forensics. Forensic Science Center, I filed some questions earlier this year in the foren in, uh, about the Forensic Science Center and samples, and it turned out to about overall 16,000 samples were awaiting testing. I'll file an updated one soon, or file an FOIA to get the information again to see what they have done. But when they were answering those questions, they boasted about this new modern forensic science center that was coming that will deal with all these problems, backlog and everything like that. Because in the old forensic science center, a whole area was closed down, roof falling down, all kinds of things. That's the excuses we heard, that we heard about. But I have been reading the Public Sector Investment Program book, Madam President, and again, since 2000, this is the 2001 book delivered in 2020, they talked about the Forensic Science Center. They said they were entering into agreements and so on, that they will get funding from China and that they will um, be able to deliver this Forensic Science Center. Madam President, today we are still Reading in the 2023 budget, construction of a new state-of-the-art facility for forensic laboratory and pathology services. The government has signed an agreement with the People's Republic of China for the financing of the construction of the facility. The government will provide the funding for the project. Development for project development, project management services designs have been revised for a new site, and the grant funding from the government of China is to be is to be received. They don't even have the money yet for the center. They don't even have the money as yet for the center based on what they say here. I'm not making this up. So what they have put forward here. So while the 16,000 samples were waiting testing, and I don't know if that situation has improved, I say I, I really do hope it has. But what, where are we going? How are we moving forward with this? We need a modern criminal justice system based on DNA analysis, based on CCTV. CCTV and, and, and body cameras for police. They buy the body cameras, they didn't buy any, they haven't purchased chargers. Half or more of the CCTV cameras not working. When you invest and you spend money in those types of things, you improve your detection and your conviction rate. And that is what the people of this country deserve. They don't deserve to be told stop eating ham and macaroni pie. They do not deserve when half of them cannot even get water three times a week to be told stop going cinema three times a week. Nobody going to cinema three times a week. You're begging for water three times a week in this country. And that is the arrogance and the level of, to which this government is so simply out of touch with the population, Madam President. On the issue of CCTV cameras, one of the things that has been raised over and over, particularly at joint select committee meetings and so on, is security within the prison. Not just to deal with contraband and all of that, but also to deal with the security for our prison officers who are risking their lives. Madam President, again, every time you look at these reports, 2021, delivered in September, October 2020, in that budget, in the PSIP, they said installation of closed circuit television systems at all prison facilities was 85% completed. All prison facilities, 85% completed. The following year, I don't have the book with me, they said they were completing it at MSP, only at MSP. Not all the prisons, only at MSP. They did not give a percentage that was completed. You know, this year, Oh, this, I think they said last year it was almost completed at MSP. And this year they say that the TT, the Trans Tobago Prison Service utilized a total of $23 million for the following. They talked about the construction of a sewage treatment plant, the purchase of three buses at the cost of $0.5 million to supplement their fleet, and the completion of the installation of CCTV systems at the maximum security prison at a cost of $0.7 million. So for three years to finish a project of putting in CCTV in one prison, in one prison. At the rate we go in, by the time they get to another prison, all the TV cameras in MSP will stop working, and they may not budget to fix them. Going nowhere, and going nowhere fast. 
when we have to address our minds to the issue of legal fees, Madam President, how they have continued to spend the money of this country. It is astounding when you look at the types of matters that they have engaged in. For us to find out, for example, about the reasons behind this government discontinuing the matter against one Mr. Malcolm Jones and to do with the WGTL um, uh, scandal that plagued Petrotrin. We had to go all the way to the Privy Council to get that, those disclosures and to get the advice, the advice delivered by one very flip-flopping attorney who I would refer to as a scoundrel. But it cost the state, it cost the taxpayer a 850. <coughs> Uh, Lutch Medial, please. Sorry. Please. So one person who flip-flopped on their advice and decided to give advice to lay a charge and then withdraw that advice and give advice to discontinue a charge. We wanted to see the advice. We just wanted sight of it to understand what was going on with that matter. We had to go to the Privy Council to get it. It cost the taxpayer of this country $850,000 because they went all the way there fighting us not to disclose that information. The government lost the OAS arbitration. They have to pay $126 million, not even legal fees being included in that. When you look at the breakdown of legal fees, and we got that breakdown of legal fees paid out by state enterprises because we realized that a lot of the money was being spent by these state companies and it was not disclosed by the Ministry of the Attorney General. The matter involving ANV Oil and Gas Limited, a total of $19.3 million in legal fees. And the simple advice, the simple advice to go to the court and try to set aside that arbitration judgment after they spend $19.3 million, they say, no, it's all right, we will pay it. We will pay, we will, we will pay ANV, it's all right. We don't, we don't want to go and try to set it aside. That is the level at which this government is operating, Madam President, and it is quite frankly extremely, extremely shameful. I feel a sense of anger on behalf of the population when I look upon these things. And the population in the meantime, the government offers absolutely no hope, none whatsoever. I woke up early this morning to take my daughter to school before I come here, and I read that two planes almost crashed because our radar system isn't working at the airport. I am reading about the fact that we used to say that everything comes through illegal ports, but things like all the guns and ammunition, the bandits have literally outgunned the DTTPS because scanners are not working on the ports. Forget about the ease of doing business and all of that. That's a whole other story by itself, where people are suffering because of the crime situation and, because, and businesses are suffering because of what is happening on the ports. And when you take those two things together, it is enough to frustrate any citizen. And that is why people are so frustrated. It's not because they're missing the ham and the macaroni pie. They just miss that feeling of being safe in their homes at night. They don't even need to eat. They might be willing to ride the bicycle to work if they could feel safe and get a proper road to ride it on. But they cannot get that because this government cannot offer that to the population. By way of policy, by way of policy in terms of national security, I was astonished. Really, I, I, I thought about it, you know, I believe in paying fair wages to our, all of our public servants. They must get a fair, a living wage. They must be able to go to the supermarket and be able to afford the basic essential items at least. And I believe in fair negotiations with them to settle wages. What I do not agree with is what I saw, and this is national security policy taking place. A memorandum from the Commissioner of Police dated the August the 29th, 2022. The subject, accelerated awards for patrols. 
The initiative as God carded to take place from September to December 2022 is designed to support active direct patrols and will comprise the following components. This went out to all deputy commissioners, assistant commissioners, commanders, and heads. Individual commendations, divisional commendations, commendation for traffic and highway patrol branch, commendations for emergency response patrol branch, commendations for divisional operation centers. Individual commendations will be awarded within 72 hours to officers who, whilst on active direct patrols, seize illegal firearms and ammunition, okay, no problem, large quantities of narco narcotics, intercept stolen vehicles, arrest wanted persons, charge offenders for other serious offenses. Additionally, officers must adhere to instructions and so on, and they go on. And they say that the... Senator Lachmini, you have yes. five more minutes. Yes, Madam President. They must adhere to the instructions outlined in the strategy and so on. Divisional commanders will be given a sum of $10,000, will be awarded, and will be used to recognize and commend officers, listen to this, to engage both in foot and mobile patrols for the four-month period. They must establish st standards, including punctuality. Punctuality, the issuance of fixed penalty tickets. Those are some of the things here. We're going to pay police to come to work on time and share tickets. We are going, this is, this is the policies implemented to improve national security in this country whilst nobody is safe and people coming into your home with, I don't even know what you call it, AK-15 or whatever it is, the big, big guns, bigger than anything the police have. This is what they are doing. And you know what is dangerous about this, Madam President? A simple Google search. If you Google search about malicious prosecution claims in Trinidad and Tobago, you will find, you will find a litany of cases. In this year alone, I could read for you. I'm sorry, my thing went down there. You could go down the road, just look at the news this year alone about the amount of money, again, that the taxpayer has to pay. And I will just read the headlines. Claxton Bay man awarded $150,000 for malicious prosecution. Repair man awarded $127,000 for malicious prosecution. State to pay in Shanishmal $0.3 million for wrongful arrest. And it goes on and on and on. Kanupia man awarded $280,000 for malicious prosecution. And that is where we're going. Lumber contractor, $170,000 in damages for malicious prosecution. Strip searched in public, man awarded 0.3 million against police. But the problem is it's not against the police. It is me and you and every other citizen that has to pay taxes, that have to pay for this. So when you incentivize, rather than you negotiate in good faith with the unions and set proper wages for the men and women of our police service, you are incentivizing just locking up people. You don't incentivize making sure your matter sees its way through court because in almost all of these matters where people sue the state, the criminal matters fall through at the magistrate's court level due to the non-attendance of police, due to the fact that they do not, um, you know, they did not follow proper procedures. And now you are incentivizing so that they will they will do these things and what you, uh, the police call it bad case, they're going to share bad case with people because they, you are rewarding them for just making up the numbers. It is a public relations stunt. It is not a policy to deal with the crime situation. So Madam President, in closing, I just want to say, the last time a population in this country was so frustrated with a government, you know, there was this thing called the do-so, and there was a hand gesture that went with it because they had to get rid of, this gov of the government of the day. They were tired of the nepotism. They were tired of the corruption. They were tired of, of the fact that every budget after budget, it was just a disappearing middle class and more oppression for the poor. It may very well be the rally cry of the tired and the oppressed. And as you drive along the highways and the byways and roundabouts and places of assembly here, there's a new cry of resistance and defiance that will inspire revolutionary zeal to get rid of the wicked and malicious regime. And I want to join all of those who are, believe they deserve more than 4%. I want to join all of those who are feeling the pain at the gas pump. I want to join all of those who are the subject of malice and ill will and political bad mind, the Ram Deans, the Ram Logans, and the Ram Brands. And I want to say, Minister Imbert, have yourself a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Senator Vera.